Good evening. Welcome to this international launch event for Matthew Sweeney's final collection, Shadow of the Owl. This is Matthew's 13th collection, bringing together the poems he wrote during a year of debilitating illness. He died from motor neuron disease just over two years ago in August 2018. We're joined tonight for readings from Shadow of the Owl by friends, poets, and loved ones from around the world, from Cork, Dublin, Belfast, London, Berlin, Switzerland, Canada, and Michigan in the United States. I'm Neil Astley, editor of Blood Axe Books, and I'm in Tarsit in Northumberland tonight. I've loved Matthew's work for many, many years and made it clear to him how much I appreciated his work. So I was delighted when he took up my offer to bring his work to Blood Axe several years ago. We then published Horse Music in 2013, followed by Inquisition Lane in 2015, and then My Life as a Painter in 2018. And it was after writing, finishing, and sending My Life as a Painter to me that he fell ill. Then he started writing poems for a new collection and kept on writing. Shadow of the Owl is that new collection, his final book of poems, whose publication we're celebrating this evening, and it has the recognition of being made a Poetry Book Society wildcard choice. Our guests this evening are in six different time zones, so it's later this evening for some and earlier this afternoon for others. The technical challenges involved in this are being handled by Pete Hebden from NCLA, Newcastle Centre for Literary Arts, and Jane Kermain of Nine Arches Press, whose format we're using. Well, our thanks go to both Pete and Jane for their invaluable assistance this evening. You, our audience, are watching this being live streamed on YouTube, while we're all in a virtual Zoom bubble of our own. If you have any comments or questions, you can put these into the YouTube chat box, and Pete will copy this over to me in our bubble to relay to our guests at the end of the readings. We hope you'll also want to order copies of Shadow of the Hour, which is currently only available from the Blood Axe website, not being officially published until Thursday. If you click on show more on the YouTube page you're watching, <coughs> you'll find an ordering link for the book. Shadow of the Hour will be available from Amazon and other retailers from Thursday. Matthew was blessed with having many friends in poetry. He had creative relationships with a number of other poets and they shared and gave feedback on each other's poems. Some of those poet friends are with us this evening to pay tribute to him and his poetry but many other poets were important to him also, most notably the much lamented John Hartley Williams in Berlin, as well as Christopher Reed and Joe Shapcott in London, and a whole crew of poets in Ireland, in Cork, Dublin, Monaghan, and Donegal in particular. Our first reader this evening is Matthew's partner, Mary Noonan in Cork, who made sure that Shadow of the Owl would be published and made available to Matthew's many readers by working with Blood Axe on Matthew's behalf. So thank you for that, Mary, and welcome. Hello, Neil and everybody else, and thank you very much uh, for being with us here tonight. Um, I'd like to just say, first of all, my deepest gratitude goes to Neil Astley for um, the beautiful production he's done on Matthew's final collection. And also my gratitude um, goes to David O'Mara, who helped me to assemble the collection and to edit um, it. Um, Matthew said in a late interview, Poetry has been central to my life, and despite the lack of money it brings, I would do it all over again. As many of you will know, and as Neil has already said, Matthew was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in 2017, October, and he died in August 2018. He wrote most of the poems in this book in the intervening 10 months, which is quite a, a, an extraordinary feat in itself. Um, Poetry was what mattered to Matthew, and he considered it a privilege to have been able to live his life as a poet. He was a rebel, an anarchist, a nonconformist to any of the forces that tried to deny or refuse poetry. Poetry was his life force, and he wanted to continue living until he died. Once he had his diagnosis, he didn't want a prognosis. He didn't want uh, to be told he was dying. He wanted to fight the illness, even though this was a hopeless endeavor. And the poems were his weapons. In order to write, he had to battle his fear. Through these poems, he became 
the bravest man alive. I know that Matthew would have been thrilled and proud to have lived, uh, if he had lived, to, to see uh, Shadow of the Owl uh, being published and to be here with you tonight, of course. Um, it is an extraordinary collection, a sequence of dark fables documenting his fear. But there is humour too, and food, and wine. And I'd like to read two poems from the collection. The Tube. Golly, a nice man wants to put a tube into my stomach and his colleagues are pleading with me to simply let him. One woman sat by my bed holding the harmless little tube as if the sight of it would make me say, yes, stick it in. Instead, I continued to be non-compliant. You might as well be holding a noose, is what I said. The woman smiled and left. I lay there and closed my eyes, imagining all the nourishment that would go through the tube, reversing my super weight loss. I would now grow fat as a sumo wrestler or as the beer drinker I once was, back when my illnesses lived in hypochondria country. I could whiz up boeuf bourguignon to baby food or even thinner and pump it in. I could learn to forget what food tastes like. They claim I could even still eat with the tube sticking out of me. But how could I revel in a Wiener schnitzel with that encumbrance? No, that would be like eating on the train to the black camp, the one with no skeletal survivors liberated by a victorious militia. I want to stay off that train for as long as I can, despite all the exhortations to board now. I want to be myself till the last minute. And indeed he was. Um, he was ordering fresh mango and Emmental cheese from his bed in the hospital, none of which, of course, were available on the hospital menu. So we were running to supermarkets, uh, you know, in, in the days before he died. He never did let them stick that tube into him. The second poem I'll read is called The Glider. Um, in the months before he died, um, in the spring of 2018, um, we had a lot of bad weather. I'm sure you had it too. Um, it was snowing a lot. Uh, we had a very bad snowstorm, I think, in March. It was called The Beast from the East, and we were all snowed in. The Glider. It has snowed all morning, and the city is white. And I see a glider has landed on a neighbor's roof. This craft too is white, with dark yellow moons on both wings and on both sides of the fuselage. The plane sits there on the slope, nose pointing to the clouds that have gone invisible in the swirls. There is no pilot sitting in it. And I know, I know for sure I am meant to play that role. But how do I get up there? And if I do, what will pull us into the sky? How indeed has it managed to land so neatly there? If I'd known about it, I'd have stood at the window all morning waiting for it. Now I rummage in a drawer till I find my leather gloves. Then I salvage from the wardrobe that sheep smelling jumper I bought in Dingle on a cold New Year's day. And I find on the hall stand my old leather jacket, also my warmest woolen scarf, and on the low shelf, a chunky knitted hat. And when I'm finally kitted out, I walk out the door to make footprints in the snow, staring at the glider, waiting to be beamed up. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, Mary. Um, now we move to London and our next reader will be Maurice Reardon, or Morris as Matthew always used to call him. Um, 
Maurice was always an unstinting friend and Matthew relied on his deep loyalty and friendship. So uh, Maurice next. Uh, thank you, Neil. I have two talents, Matthew, you claim. One is I always find a seat in a pub. The other is I can put together a book of poems. So thank you, Mary and David, for doing a totally Sweeney-esque job in putting together this astonishing, really, truly amazing posthumous collection. Matthew and I were friends for over 35 years, food came into it and football and wine, pool, family meals, ways of making money, games. I remember Matthew once devised a board game with his friend Guy Carter, I think it was called Drek, uh, to make money. And it was really a very good uh, game, but it didn't, um, it didn't make any money. <laughs> Poetry was the heart of our friendship, basically a decades long conversation in and about poets and poems and the revision of poems. Um, we shared the same views about lots of things and often we differed too, but um, uh, we, never, we never fell out as it were. Uh, Okay, just one, I had one little techie moment there. Sorry about that. Uh, but the past couple of weeks, a sentence uh, I came across um, in a piece by Valzina Mort has been running in my head. Poetry is a language the dead use to help us forget that they are dead. So that's where we are on this occasion, forgetting that Matthew is not with us but doing so successfully through the medium of his poems. I'll read uh, three poems. Uh, I'll read Sweet Song. It's one of those poems that reaches into the otherworldly while keep, keeping us, as Matthew liked to put it, anchored in the real world. Sweet Song. I was playing melodic jazz that had seeped all the way from the Baltic when it cut out to be replaced by a very loud singing that filled every space in the house. I stood there, espresso cup in hand, thinking I'd never been hit by anything so sweet, not even that dawn bird symphony in Maida Vale after a night of acid. Tears cascaded down my hairy face. I didn't know the language of the song, but I understood it. And I couldn't tell if the singer was a man or a woman or an angel. The melody suggested a being dancing alone on the moon while meteorites swirled in slow circles around her head. Why was I being subjected to this sublime private recital. How long would it go on? Should I applaud or would that be crass? Ruminating like this at a great distance from the music, I went to lie on the carpet. The song was long, but it kept morphing into other songs. Now it conjured the seabed, next the Arctic snow, Till finally it stopped so suddenly, I shrieked. The Baltic gang were at their violining and saxophoning again, but now they sounded like toneless, malevolent dwarves mired in the world. And crucifixion which is full of Matthew's black humor, uh, but with it crucially, his comic sense of timing. Crucifixion. I was boiling a beetroot when the doorbell rang. Who the hell is this? I muttered, marching to the door. When I opened it, the sun was so bright, I only saw silhouettes 
but that was enough for looming over everything was a big black cross. There were two men, one with the face of a goat, the other a huge fellow with a fag in his mouth and sweat on his face from carrying the cross. The first man grinned, shaking his bag of nails and patting the hammer in his belt. We've come to carry out your crucifixion. Seeing my reaction, he laughed. Don't worry, it's all been paid for. The other man had set the cross down and was checking out the lawn for the best location. And I ask who's paid for it, I stuttered. Surely there's been a huge mistake. A laugh ensued. No mistake, sir. It was your good self exactly who ordered the happening. See here, he said, shoving a signed order form into my face. It was my name, all right, but it was a forgery. I pointed this out to no avail, so I shouted, that was enough. Kindly leave this premises immediately and ask your giant clown not to forget his cross. I slammed the door, then wheeled an armchair up against it and sat in this after getting my biggest sharp knife. I had my mobile prime to call the police, but I thought I heard the two lumbering down the path. And a look through the spy hole confirmed this. I went back to the kitchen to check my beetroot. It had nearly boiled dry and the water was red. And finally, I read from the owl. I read two sections from the owl. Uh, this is a poem that uh, Matthew, I think, was writing all his life against his great adversary, and all of, <laughs> our all for all of us the great adversary. Um, and surely, I think it is among his finest. Section one, no one knows where I'm going, not even me. Although that owl I heard outside last night might lead me to the terrain and call out the custodians so they can surround and welcome me or do whatever they want to do. I won't speak, won't say my name, even if they try to coerce me or play unearthly music such as sailors here far out on the Atlantic, in fog so thick they venture to climb it to reach clear sky. Some do and speak of large blue birds that glide there silently as ghosts. But those men return too damaged to speak much or stay above ground very long. The owl could tell more if he wanted, but he won't. And not only that, he's decided he will never be seen. I've heard stories about owls, how they appear from nowhere at the edge of things to sit watching, usually staying silent, but sometimes uttering a few words in their night language we don't understand. That's my fellow, although I don't know him. Should I leave the house and hold my right arm out for him to land on and turn his big eyes on me, if he'd be so compliant? Or should I try to forget him, pretend he's not there in the dark, like a tree I hadn't noticed growing? Oh, at least I should stop mentioning him here. But what else can I write about? not the journey I am taking that I know nothing of, not yet, and when I do, I mightn't feel like writing. I think the solution might be to buy a t-shirt with an owl painted on it, a blue owl on a yellow shirt, and write about that small fellow to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. <coughs> We're now going to move to Berlin, um, to Matthew's German translator, Jan Wagner. 
Um, Jan has published two previous translations of Matthew's work and his German translation of Shadow of the Owl will be published next year by Hansa Berlin. Uh, Jan Radner's reading of his own poetry shared with Charlotte van den Broek back in March for NCLA in Newcastle was the last live reading I went to. Uh, so it feels very strange to meet up with uh, Jan again now and he's going to continue uh, the reading from the owl. Thanks, Neil. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, as you know, and as Mary knows for sure, Matthew was beloved by, by many readers in Germany, and uh, we had a lot of um, uh, marvelous readings uh, in front of enthusiastic audiences um, throughout Germany. Um, so Hansa Verlag immediately said, we will do this wonderful last collection of Matthews as well, um, which is lovely, and it will spend uh, the next month's um, going over the uh, translations and uh, doing some new ones. Um, the, the sequence that Maurice um, read, or the first parts of which Maurice just read, um, I, I translated some, some time ago when Matthew was still alive. And in fact, we had been planning to perform it someday um, in English and German alongside some jazz performance, perhaps that never happened, of course. Um, but I will read the, uh, the last two parts of, of the owl sequence, both in Matthew's original and, and the German translation. 11. I spent the morning drawing owl after owl on bits of paper. And after I got somewhere near a proper depiction, I found a black marker and reproduced this on an A2 drawing page, which I print sticked onto the gable wall. Then I dug out my old black bow and four arrows and unleashed these into the body of the owl. I knew I was being provocative, maybe even launching an act of war, but I could take no more and couldn't see what I had to lose. The owl clearly was unmoved by this, so I repeated the desecration four times over till the drawn owl looked machine gunned, whereupon I flung the bow down on the grass and went in to pour a large glass of Telesker for the first time in months, if not years. It still tasted good. I slipped on kind of blue, which always chilled me and lay on the sofa with my shoes kicked off and the curtains wide open. I thought that the owl do his worst. Elf. Einen Vormittag lang malte ich Eule um Eule auf Papierfetzen. Als ich ziemlich nahe dran war, an einer naturgetreuen Abbildung, nahm ich schwarzen Marker und reproduzierte das Bild auf DIN A2-Format klebte es mit Pritt an die Giebelwand, kramte den alten schwarzen Bogen und vier Pfeile hervor und ließ sie auf den Eulenkörper prasseln. Eine Provokation, keine Frage, vielleicht gar ein kriegerischer Akt, doch ich hielt es nicht mehr aus, hatte eh nichts zu verlieren. Die Eule ließ dies offenbar kalt, also wiederholte ich die Schändung vier weitere Male, bis die Zeichnung aussah wie von Kugeln durchsiebt woraufhin ich den Bogen auf den Rasen warf und hineinging, mir ein großes Glas Telsker gönnte, den ersten seit Monaten oder sogar seit Jahren. Es schmeckte noch immer. Ich schob Kind of Blue rein, das mich immer beruhigte, lag auf dem Sofa und streifte die Schuhe ab, alle Vorhänge weit offen, dachte, soll die Eule tun, was sie will. 12. When the dark came, I lurked in the kitchen, bow in hand, arrows on the quiver that hung from my left shoulder, like the Robin Hood I wanted to play in the school pantomime. I got little John instead. I kept looking out at the dark garden, wondering if I should be there, waiting to fire arrows or any sound or movement. Why did I want to kill the owl? He hadn't given me the news I dreaded, but he'd stayed silent. That was more 
than I could bear. I poured a glass of Malbec and put on a CD of Baltic jazz. Did he think I could wait forever as if I were a rock? I sliced some cheddar and a heel of bread, opened the door, the back door, and went out. The moon turned its big eye onto me, and I saw it wobble. The stars hummed along. Where am I going? I shouted at all of them. There was no response. Then, far off, I heard a faint hoo hoo hoo, followed by a woo. You cowardly bastard, I roared and sprayed the arrows all over the blackened world. Zwölf. Als die Nacht anbrach, kauerte ich in der Küche mit meinem Bogen, mit dem Pfeilen im Köcher über der linken Schulter wie der Robin Hood, den ich im Schultheater hatte spielen wollen. Es reichte für Little John. Ich starrte hinaus zum dunklen Garten. Sollte ich lieber dort sein, beim geringsten Laut oder Huschen Pfeile feuern? Weshalb wollte ich die Eule töten? Sie hatte nicht die befürchtete Nachricht gebracht, doch geschwiegen. Das war mehr, als sie sich aushalten ließ. Ich goss mir ein Glas Malbec ein, legte baltischen Jazz auf. Glaubte sie, ich könne ewig warten, als wäre ich ein Fels? Ich schnitt etwas Cheddar und Brot auf, öffnete die Hintertür, trat hinaus. Der Mond wandte mir sein großes Auge zu, ich sah ihn schwanken. Die Sterne summten mit. Wo gehe ich hin? schrie ich sie alle an, erhielt keine Antwort. Da hörte ich in der Ferne ein schwaches Hu, 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 dann ein Buhu. Du feiges Miststück, brüllte ich und bedeckte mit Pfeilen die schwarz gewordene Welt. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Now we move from Germany to the French-speaking part of Switzerland, uh, to Porek Rooney. Porek has lived in Switzerland for many years, where he teaches in Basel, uh, as well as living at Set in France, where some of the poems in Shadow of the Owl are set. Um, Matthew greatly valued Porek's creative friendship, as well as staying in his, in his apartment in the Rue de la Révolution in Set, as you'll hear from the poems which Porek has chosen to read. Porek. Thank you, Neil. Um, I've picked out three poems that reference Set in this uh, wonderful book. There are about five or six but by my count, and um, clearly Set played a, a role in Matthew's life and in Mary's life uh, in, during that last year. Uh, he and Mary came for Christmas 2018 to visit, and I went down to see them, and that was the last time I saw Matthew. But he was alive, as always, to um, the food and wine of France, and that appears in a number of these poems, and also to um, Paul Valéry, who's the, the well-known French poet who's, who's from Set, and w was struggling that Christmas, he's struggling with lots of things that Christmas, but he was struggling with a translation of Valerie's uh, cimetière, uh, marine cemetery, cimetière marin. So I'm going to read uh, Pete's set. It's the first of three poems. And I do remember that Matthew texted me sometime in January when I had left to tell me that he had been for pizza um, in, in, in our, our local and how it didn't live up to um, his usual Standard, Matthew is, often had arguments with uh, cuisine if it, if it didn't quite live up to what he expected to be. So one of those last arguments with uh, pizza, a set. The wood-fired oven was as good as any in Napoli, and the super thin, crispy crust was a piece of snob's delight. But the tomato sauce was wrong. Where was the oregano and why was this dried basil? Making it all sweet and persuading me, I was eating a Provencal soup au pistou. 
I found myself longing for torn leaves of fresh basil and wondering why the French even bothered to try this. But every table was full and most were laden with pizza. And I knew that set was half Italian. It even used to be called Cette until the Académie Française intervened. And yesterday, I knew called comes from pisaladier, an onion tart I can buy here in the market, and that would make all the Italian stuff derivative. Yeah, as if I could ever forget the pizza I had in Napoli all those jolly years ago. Wasn't it normal to have border fights over everything? I knew Set was far from the border, but it was a southern port with a fast line to Genoa. So, just as a large man walked past, shouting, Arrivederci, at someone, or possibly at me. I almost responded, thinking the fellow would know all about the art of making pizza and might even teach me how. That uh, last Christmas, uh, um, Matthew had difficulty getting around set and the apartment was on the hill and as he has mentioned in several of the poems in the book is on the fourth floor so it was quite a strenuous climb and so one of his other sorties was to a Vietnamese restaurant and as always the problem is how to how to get back or how to get home so this poem does battle with that. Taxi a set I asked the nice man from Vietnam to call a taxi. He just brought the name, but this request was a high bridge on the River Kwai I'd ordered him to bomb. I had no idea why he reacted like that. I was gobsmacked when he went round all his patron, sitting there wielding chopsticks and asked each of them if they had numbers for taxi firms. He jotted down plenty of numbers. It was really the first time he'd been approached about this. All the tables had wine bottles. How did these savage drinkers get home? I thanked him for his failure, paid the bill, and struggled up the hill to the flat. On the way, I remembered all the times I'd arrived at the Gare de Set, hoping to find a taxi but they were always in Montpellier. Back then, I didn't need one, but now I did. Anyway, I made it and managed the stairs, pausing on each landing, before letting myself in to play John Coltrane. I opened the window to share the noise, just as a taxi turned into Rue de la Révolution to speed down past my temporary home, where it could have bragged, disgorging me, before carrying on to where it liked to roam. And the, the third poem in this little sequence about Set is called Translating Paul Valéry, who is one of those fairly abstruse French poets who's really difficult to translate. I do wonder if, uh, as a poet, he's pulling your leg or, or really being uh, obscure. Many have tried, few have succeeded. I do, do believe the late uh, Derek Mahan um, did a translation of the Marine Cemetery, which is Paul Valéry's most famous poem. This is Matthew's attempt at struggling with uh, the muse of Valéry. Translating Paul Valéry. When I started translating Paul Valéry, my French was so ropey, I kept dragging the poor poet into the realm of surrealism, a place he didn't want to be, or so I thought. Until one day, I recognized he darted in there from time to time while pretending he didn't. This was quite a trick, I admitted, and I had to find ways to reveal this, which meant my going back to set. 
I found a flat in Rue de la Révolution, up for. I dreamt I was a fisherman in La Pointe Courte, but could walk on the water, drawing. As a result, I was quite rich, which was not the case when I woke up. Still, a view of the Mediterranean out of one tiny window reminded me I was in the South. Valerie reposed. And after a hunt, I found his grave. Very garlicky anchovies, which necessitated a glass of red wine. I was tempted to have a second, but I stayed strong. Some force was guiding me. I tread past the market, witnessing the enormous pile of dumped shells before returning to the flat and digging out the latest translation I'd been stalled on, only to find that Valerie's ghost had restored the touches of surrealism before adding flourishes that were beyond me. Thank you, Porik. And uh, apologies to our audience for some of the interference on the line from Switzerland. I hope the line to Dublin will be better. And we're going to hear next from Elaine Nahuilanan, who's who was Ireland Professor of Poetry from 216 to 219. Um, Elaine got to know and admire Matthew in recent years following his return to Ireland. Um, so I hope we're now going to hear from Elaine. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to, to Mary and also to Neil. Uh, I'm very glad to take part in this and indeed to see so many friends in uh, far foreign fields. I'm going to read three poems uh, which all have the uh, unexpectedness that it was so much part of, uh, of Matthew's style. Unexpectedness uh, and, of course, recurring themes, as you will hear. The Albatross. Well, I tried to walk the tightrope over the ravine, but I fell in. Luckily, I only broke my left big toe, and the snakes didn't get to me before the Albatross pounced and brought me to the island, where I lay on the black sand under the sun, tolling the pain by whistling that hornpipe I could never dance to, even back when I was winning medals in any fesh I entered. The albatross perched on a rock, staring. I could see he was wondering what he'd saved, but he was happy to leave me where I was. I removed my blue hat from my head and limped over to put it on his feathered crown. He didn't try to stop me, and after a minute, he took off and flew out over the bay, keeping low as if he thought the blue hat might make the fish curious. Not then, but maybe later. And when he returned, he sat on my foot and the pain seeped away. This one is called Plum Sake. The plum sake was left in a china carafe with a design of purple flowers on it. I found it on the low wall as I took the bin out. One sip was enough to show how good it was, but who'd brought it here? I sat and drank slowly as the sunset, wanting more before it was gone. I left the empty carafe there and went in. I was imagining swooping in a glider low over the ocean as I reclined on the sofa till the quiet ringing of a bell brought me out into the garden to see the carafe was full again. This time I continued down the path to check if anyone was lurking, any waiter or waitress in a black kimono with a bottle of sake, maybe brandishing a samurai sword with a red bowl for my severed head. 
but all I met was a blind three-legged dog. I returned to the plum sake and this time brought a chair out from the kitchen so I could savour it better. Where could I buy this nectar? Would I have to return to Japan? I heard avian activity and a long-tailed bird with a black forehead landed on the gate. I'd never seen one of those before. I sipped my sake slowly as the rising moon, closing my eyes to taste it better. Ages later, I nipped into the little room, and when I came back again, the carafe was full. I offered no complaint, even raised my drink to toast the invisible supplier, but I knew this was my last one. I was not stupid. It was almost dark now, an owl would soon join the bird on the gate. I whistled a jagged early Tom Waits tune, then glugged my plum sake down and went in. And the last one that I will read is called Returning to a Borrowed House. And I suppose it is a return poem in more than one way. Returning to a borrowed house. When I came in, it was dark. A big cat ran across my feet, or was it a badger? Where was the moon? The key tried not to work for me, then relented. I fell in onto the stone floor. I opened a bottle of red wine and sat at the table. I got up again to light the six wicks on the candelabra, then stood conducting the six dancing flames, I launched into a homemade aria. The lyrics I improvised were to do with monks marooned on an island, one of them longing for a nun on the mainland. I introduced a psychic crow for ballast. I felt I'd earned a slice of bread with Stilton. I sat down again and poured more wine the ghosts had gathered at the windows to stare at me. I ignored them. I was an interloper here, born and bred in Donegal, a day's boat ride away. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, next, we have uh, another long-term friend in poetry of Matthews, David O'Mara, who actually helped him in editing the manuscript of the book. Uh, David knows Matthew's work inside out and his and Mary's help in finalising the text of Shadow of the Owl have been invaluable. So I'd like to say good afternoon now to David in Canada and welcome to our evening event. Thank you, Neil. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, hi from Ottawa. Uh, it's a real honour to uh, be part of this uh, celebration of Matthew's work and his final book. Um, it's a it's a it's a beautiful haunting uh, volume, um, and uh, there's so many great poems in here. It was difficult to choose uh, which ones. Um, and I also want to I know it's been a two years over two years, but I did want to extend my condolences to all all of Matthew's friends and family, uh, and his fans. Um, we all miss him terribly. Um, I'm going to start uh, with the juggler. I think uh, many of us know uh, Matthew's uh, love of the carnival-esque, so I thought I would read this. The juggler. The balls are in the air again, twirling round the invisible sun. I'm a juggler. I wear the green jersey of Ireland and orange gloves. The blue dog sits watching me, the plump yellow cat ignores me. The white butterflies, as usual, try to outdo the balls. One day soon, a planet will collide with a spaceship and there'll be only one winner. I have my jazz playing. It pleases the dog and infuriates the cat. I have eaten my allotted meal of stir-fried tofu and black beans tossed with chopped coriander and ease down with a cup of sake. The balls must spin for 10 minutes. 
they must stay at the same speed. I imagine kings watching me, presidents, dictators, film directors. I grin a lot. When the time is up, I catch each ball, secrete it in a different pocket, then check the camera as captured the whole revolving show and my face is behaved for the select crowd. Or must I do it all again? The butterflies by this stage are confused and collide with the window panes. It is time to feed the dog his stewed rabbit hearts, the cat her courgette and crispy fish skin. And this poem is called Dubrovnik. Um, I know Mary mentioned earlier, uh, um, before we started uh, the broadcast, that how much Matthew loved uh, travel. And I think this reflects that, though uh, it also reflects how I think Matthew believed that, uh, you know, any experience, however truncated, was worth recording. Um, and I, I kept in touch with him quite a bit uh, working on this book before he passed away. And uh, when I asked him, you know, what poems he absolutely wanted to have in the collection, um, this was certainly always on the top of the list. He quite liked it. Dubrovnik. What a beautiful city. The trip was daft, of course. All those hours traveling with a surprise stop in Bosnia and no passport. I'd left this in the hotel. To arrive at the high up ancient walled city called Starigrad, somewhere I'd longed to visit. I had no time to enjoy it though, or take it in. I just registered its majesty, sitting above the Adriatic like a tiara. What a stupid way to visit a great city. Better not to have made the journey at all. I remembered I'd had to catch a bus at 6 a.m. and waste the whole day traveling. But hey, I went there, spent a couple of ridiculous aimless hours, and no one can take this away from me. No, I can always say I visited Dubrovnik, even if I cannot recommend any music, venues, or restaurants I enjoyed eating in. I don't care at all if you don't believe me. And I'll just finish with uh, the title poem, Shadow of the Owl. The loudspeaker hidden in the thorn bush is pouring out Sinatra, while a sharp light comes on above my head and a flurry of wings arrives from behind me and the shadow of the owl covers me, then recedes into night. I am sitting here on a log in the wee small hours of the morning. Thanks, Frank. Reminiscing about my student days in the black forest that ghost in the tower, and the pile of bottles we left behind us following the farewell party. I can still smell the marijuana, and the wine I'm now drinking is superior, but I couldn't fling myself around in a punk dance like them. I hear an ooh-hoo, and another, before the owl's wings drop their poncho of shadow again. What does the creature want from me tonight? I thought he'd done with me, done his worst. Sinatra is embarking on a song called Ill Wind. I empty the bottle and fling it into the dark, enjoying the smash against the rock. I go in. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now we will hear from uh, poet and retired undertaker Thomas Lynch, who's in Indian River, Michigan in the States, uh, where it's now Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Tom's creative friendship with uh, Matthew goes back many years, as does his love of Ireland, where he's always spent as much time as possible until this year. And I know that Matthew, uh, just a couple of years ago, spent some time with Tom um, in Michigan. And so I'm sure he'll be remembering that this evening. Tom. Thanks, Neil. And 
thanks to you and, and to Mary for the invitation to be part of this launch. It's a real comfort to be among uh, people who love Matthew, loved his poetry, and uh, were loved in return by him. So um, it conjures uh, his powerful uh, presence in these words. I'm a member of a fellowship that claims that the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. And I sometimes think that uh, Matthew's powerful spirit is still working its way through and among us. And uh, gatherings like this make it more, more real to me. So thanks again, Neil and, and Mary, and indeed all of Matthew's friends. I, uh, I began my relationship with Matthew in, sometime in, uh, I think, in 1988. And soon after, uh, he came to America, and I picked him up at the airport and took him for, because I knew he was something of a foodie, I took him for a Coney Island hot dog that you can only get in, in southeastern lower Michigan. And it's a frankfurter with, made of uh, otherwise throwaway meat products uh, and, and encased in a, a steamed bun and slathered with chili and mustard and onions. He thought I was trying to poison him and I don't think he ever forgave me. And though we had many meals together after that, he would never uh, agree to having a meal unless he could choose the restaurant and the menu because he didn't trust my own taste in, in cuisine. This is a poem of Matthew's called Onions. I had my favorite 70s sandwich for lunch today. You'd be good if you could guess what it was, especially if I said I could only find it in Buncrana on the sea in a foodie bar called the Drift Inn. No, there wasn't the tiny ghost of a prawn there or a slice of smoked salmon. No sardines either. I'm aware they swim nowhere near Donegal and no crab ever, although I'd be all for that. You'll be gobsmacked when I reveal what it was, roast beef with tomato and slivers of raw onion on brown bread. Mustard was an option I always availed of, and I think I had to have a dark pint. Seldom the latter now, but I made the sandwich with slices of leftover roast beef, organic tomato, and yes, a touch of raw onion, all on rye bread. It was so perfect, I almost paused to hunt for the pint. I compensated with two or maybe three glasses of Medoc. I sat there licking my teeth, picking up the crumbs and sniffing the perfume on my fingers. I knew it wouldn't wash away. And I saw then that the onion, although sparingly used, was the undoubted star, the Roy Keane of the team. But that strong taste is hardly what I'd class gourmet. Some cuisines, believe it or not, excommunicate it. Onions came up in a pub recently. A woman was saying they were great for the blood. Yeah, I thought, recalling Miss Doherty, my father's ascetic assistant who ate onion sandwiches every day and died of leukemia. And this is called trauma. It involves, uh, Matthew often had difficult relationships with inanimate objects, particularly if they had noise in, uh, attached to them. Trauma. I must declare I'm a Buddhist. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. And this will color everything I have to tell you. I was having a Zen evening. I'd cooked big noodles and coconut cream and was spooning them in quite leisurely when my peace was exploded by the sudden attack of a hoover. I am not exaggerating. It was like a soldier had burst into the house with a flamethrower, raising everything in his path. I admit I was puzzled. This was none other than my sweet partner. No Buddhist, maybe, but certainly a fellow traveler and no lover of the dreaded hoover which I would like to ban. 
Anyway, she advanced noisily into the sitting room, mopping up and God knows what, taking off the brush end to nakedly gobble what was there. It was right then I got curious. In the morning, we were taking a taxi to the airport to fly to Tibet with a changeover in Nuuk. It was no time to clean the house. So I advanced gingerly to witness what I'd class a minor war crime. She was sucking up small gangs of flying ants who'd somehow gained entry to the house. I watched her, how she'd switch the monster off and sit down to enjoy her soap opera with one eye on the carpet. Then up she'd bounce to hoover up the latest intrepid black marauder. I wanted to grab the machine and put my mouth to the tube to suck back the little fellows, but I knew they'd be dead, murdered with no guilt at all and more mayhem would follow. I went upstairs to meditate and the stress must have caused me to sleep. But all night the Hoover sporadically woke me and I don't know how I'll cope with the place or with my sweetheart. And let me finish with, I suppose they call these ekphrastic poems, The Descent into Limbo. Uh, and it's in memory of um, Peter Niemeyer, who was Matthew's Dutch uh, translator. And, uh, and Peter became my Dutch translator through Matthew's good offices. And uh, some month, or two before my last meal with Matthew at a Nepalese restaurant, I think in Pope's Key in Cork, I met um, Peter Niemeyer's widow in Galway. The Descent into Limbo. Peter, someone, was it yourself, has sent me a postcard I wrote to you in March, 1992. On the picture side, we see Montaigne's depiction of Christ climbing down into limbo. He looks a bit like you. Is that where you are now? Though I know limbo has been abolished. You wouldn't care about that. Why send my old postcard back to me? What stamps did you use? In my handwriting, I say I can't be sure I'm deciphering yours enough to get your address right, but I must have. You've included no address this time. I know I gave you carte blanche to contact me in a variety of ways, including carrier, pigeon, or crow, but this method you've chosen is the oddest, even if it seems the simplest. And if you respond to my words here, you'll recall I ruled out telepathy. Not that you'd try that. No, your way will be careful, sure, as you always like to be. Do you remember being in a car with me, passing slowly through Newry during an orange parade? I was laughing at how silly they looked with their hats and sashes, and I went to open the window to tell them this. You stopped the car and asked me to get out, whereupon I desisted in my clowning, and we continued in silence on our journey to Donegal. That was before 1992. Last time we met was, I think, in 2003 in Antwerp. I took a train from Rotterdam to find you sitting outside a bar. I saw your damage immediately. Was this a pretaste of limbo? If that's where you are, I need to know. You choose how. Thank you, Tom. And now the last poem we're going to hear from here is going to be from Matthew's daughter, Nico, who's in Belfast. Nico. I hope. Hello. Thank you very much, Neil and Mary and David for putting this lovely event on. Dad would have been really proud and would have embraced the whole Zoom 
format. It's lovely that everyone can be together from all around the world and um, Dad would have been very proud. So thank you very much. Um, it's a lovely production, as Mary said, of the book. Thank you. And Dad was very proud of this collection. He did say that he felt his whole life's work was working towards this collection and he was very proud of it. Um, his grandchildren, Nell and Jude, are watching eagerly from our living room and his family from Donegal and son from Melbourne from London. So it's lovely that everyone can join in. Thank you. Dad wrote this poem in hospital. I was sitting beside him as he wrote it. And this was the last poem that he wrote. Mary and Melvin and I spent his last week with him in the hospital. And um, there were some really precious moments that we had. Dad really was himself to the very end. And um, he had so much of himself still there and present. So this was his last poem. After they gave me morphine, following the incident when my heart stopped for eight minutes and a bunch of doctors in red suits attached a loose curtain of coloured wires to my body. I woke up in intensive care to later try to sleep again. A very light, broken sleep full of weird dreams. In the first of these, I was eating a sandwich on a riverbank. And when I was nearly finished, I saw it featured a hairy slice of mouse. And yes, I gobbled this and it was good. The, che the chef was senior morphing. I won't tell you about the other dreams. And that was for David O'Meara, who was a big friend of dad's. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, for mouse sandwich. Um, so we're now going to go into a uh, collective mode, and I hope we're going to be brought together very shortly by our marvellous technician, Pete. Um, I've been getting some uh, 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 remarks fed through, some, uh, some comments and questions, some things people want to pass on. Um, so while that's happening, um, I could perhaps pass on a few of those. Um, we have um, Gerard Mannix, who's sends greetings from North Cork. He said, uh, I completed the course with Matthew in 2012 during his time at UCC. Matthew touched my life and I continue to embrace words. I look forward to this new book. Thank you all. And then uh, Guy Carter, who says he was the co-inventor with Matthew of Drac, the board game famous in Dombey Street. He says, a lovely poetic seance summoning his spirit. The interference was clearly his critique of Porrick Rooney's reading. Sorry, Porrick, about that. Um, we've got lots of comments from people in Canada, uh, lot, lots of comments from people all, all over Ireland. Uh, the reading is a very touching tribute to Matthew Sweeney's poems, says Rona Shafran in, uh, Shafran in Canada or beautifully read by his partner and close friends. Um, some very nice messages. Um, let's see. Uh, Cronan and Donna in Cork, delighted to be joining us. Isabel Dixon, uh, so glad to be here amongst many time zones, thanking us for publishing the book. Uh, Leanne Quinn from Munich. Um, Eleanor Schuswick from London. Um, no, it's not. It's Liz, not Eleanor. Eleanor has hijacked her chat. Jane Clark, hello all, especially Mary Noonan. Uh, very much looking forward to hearing the work. This was from the beginning. So I think that's where we've got in relation to um, comments coming in. Oh, Louise Peterkin, hi from her and Rob McKenzie, and a bottle of Vina Mobile de Multipolciana in Scotland, I think. Um, so that's where we are on the um, comments that have come in on the chat. But if Pete's going to bring us together, uh, our wonderful technician, then we should be able to come together and just say a few more things, perhaps. Um, just hoping this is going to work.
if everybody could just turn their videos back on, then uh, everybody can be on screen together. Right, so yes, I think we're all coming together now. We're all turning our videos back on. I can see everyone. Um, so, one of the things that struck me in the reading was you all read very differently, but somehow I kept hearing the cadences of Matthew's readings in your readings of his poems. Uh, there was a kind of infectiousness in, in those cadences that we all know from him reading, but also from the work itself. I was wondering whether anyone else had picked up on that. Oh, we, we, we can't hear Tom. Tom. Tom's audio isn't on. He's saying something. There we are. Yep, got you. Uh, I, I think I heard the same thing. Uh, there is a there is a Matthewism that sort of uh, waves over all of us because many of you will recall that he his his you all know his script was tiny and printed and all uh, and the paper he would use off often very small you know there was no A4 paper so. He was so precise about the, the, the word measures. I don't know that he had, he wasn't counting iams or trochees, but he was so precise about the way words, you know, sort of acquainted themselves with the next one in line that um, I think that's what, what you heard when you heard Matthew read his own work and Maybe that's the thing that comes across because uh, it's the jazz line, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And then we've got a question now from David James. Which poets would you say were Matthew's heroes? Who influenced him the most? Well, certainly Jan might comment on his German influences. Well, um, as as you know, Matthew spent uh, spent his um, some years of his studies in Germany, and and uh, and uh, I think one of the main reasons he he came over uh, was his love for Kafka. Um, and so, uh, even though Kafka is not a poet in the strict sense, um, um, I think he was a huge influence on uh, on Matthew, and uh, and and uh, also Heinrich von Kleist, who is not. Was less lesser known than Kafka, of course, uh, appealed to him as well. And in fact, he wrote some wrote a lovely poem on um, um, on Kleist's grave close to the uh, um, Wannsee in Berlin, uh, describing some horses that get into the water and swim towards Kleist's grave, uh, or, Kle or the stone, mem mem um, um, the memorial stone where uh, on the spot where Kleist uh, um, shot himself. But I think Kafka uh, certainly would be the the German language author that that uh, that Matthew uh, uh, adored, mm. and also the poets of the what were called by a Mexican editor the generation of the Lamb, the poets he used to meet at the Lamb near near where he lived in Dombey Street. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can I come in there because uh, I would have been one of the Lambs, as it were. Um, but uh, Jan is absolutely, uh, Kafka, Kafka was God, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he was very influenced by American poets, uh, Charles, Charles Simic or Simic, whichever you want to pronounce it, was um, a complete hero, Mark Strand. Um, he um, was, hmm, sorry, uh, uh, he, he was- Tom um, Waits. <laughs> Oh, and Tom Waits. Tom Waits, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I put up with, I had to put up with an awful lot of Tom Waits, Tom. <laughs> um, I mean, I like Tom Waits. I went to hear him in Toronto when I was young for that. But, you know, Matthew, uh, yeah, Matthew was, uh, yeah, Tom Waits was a big hero. But, uh, yeah, he, I mean, he, he was like all of us, sort of moved around a bit. But I would I, I thought those kind of... Uh, Remember him telling me kind of when he was at um, UEA for, for a year, like he, he really went into the library and, you know, he thought, you know, he thought like, I know more, basically he thought I know more about American poetry than you do now because I've read it all, uh, and, uh, which was the case, yeah. But I remember Simic or Simic was, was really, um, 
was really a star for him, yeah, yeah. and remains. So I think that kind of spareness of language, yeah, together with, um, as Elaine was saying, the kind of constant surprise of what comes next, you know. Mm. And there were the, the kinds of poets he put into emergency kit, weren't there, with Joe Shapcott, people like James Tate and so on, that, yeah. that yeah. sort of alternative yeah. realism or... Mm. He, he did love that, I don't know if you can hear me, he did love American poetry. Um, and in fact, um, the, the poet who was most influential on him when he was starting out was Sylvia Plath. Um, he used to carry in his pockets around London, you know, in the early 1970s, two, um, two collections, two, two of Plath's collections in these kind of worn cloth bound copies, which I still have here in the house, you know, and uh, they were his Bibles in a way at the beginning of his poetry life. Um, and I, he loved Eastern European poetry. He loved German poetry. Uh, he, he also loved uh, the German poet Georg Trakel, um, a very, very dark, melancholic poet. And um, yeah, and then he looked to America. I think he was trying very much to get out from under the yoke of the Irish uh, poetry generation, which had just preceded him, the big, huge uh, pillars like Heaney and Mahan. And, you know, he wanted to establish himself from out under, from away from their shadow, I suppose. So he started looking to Germany and to Eastern Europe and to America, you know, to find his own voice. That was my feeling, certainly, you know. He was also a storyteller as well, wasn't he? I mean, he loved Walter de la Mer, and he was also a children's writer, and he loved writing poems for children, which were all poems which told stories. Yeah, yeah. I was looking over some interviews uh, that Matthew gave in the last few months of his life, and he said that... Um, Although sound is clearly, you know, fundamental to poetry, the, the sonorous nature, he said, I'm not one of these poets who's going to go for, to the wall for the sound. Because for him, and he said it, he said it over and over, the visual was so important. He wanted yeah. his poems to be like little films. He wanted it to be crystal clear, the images, you know, the, 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 the visual nature of it. Uh, that seemed to be very important to him. And, and, and that's not, I suppose that would tie in with the story, the, the narrative aspect as well, you know. Um, but, and yeah. also taste, there's so much food in the poems, isn't there? <laughs> when yeah. I was reading these, uh, the, the book, I kept on, seeing Sunday's Well and Cork. And I mean, I, I know there are clues there as well, but yeah. it seemed to me to be, although not, a, but not at all a book about place to have, to be soaked in a particular landscape, which of course I recognize. Yeah, yeah, it, it uh, is, I mean, yeah. It was very That's strong. So true, because he wasn't able to move around as much at the end. He wasn't able to travel, you see. And so he started focusing on the, the three kilometers around his own home, you know, and it was the shaky bridge, the River Lee, the hill into town, the North Mall, and, and, and it was all, yeah, so it's, you, you, you really can recognize um, that part of Cork from the book because his focus has narrowed in to the mm -hmm. garden and the streets around the house, you know? Even the, uh, the looking, uh, the, the, the fact that you're looking down and therefore you're looking out uh, to be right there in his poems. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, there's a lot of poems in the book about the birds, you know, look, cause he's up in his bedroom looking out. And as you say, Sunday's Well is on a hill. So he's looking out and he's seeing, he can see the university from the bedroom and he's talking about the birds. He's watching the birds landing on the, the roofs of the houses around. And one of the birds seems to be an angel. Uh, there's a poem in the book mm -hmm. called An Angel. It's, it's, it's not a good angel though, it's a bad angel, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, you're right, it's, it's mm -hmm. up high looking out. Yeah, I've got some more comments here. Um, Isabel Dixon says um, it felt like a gentle channeling of Matthew's re readings here. Uh, it was lovely to hear those owls in German, Jan, she says. And Louise Peterkin uh, says, uh, thanks to all, and it's great to see Matthew was writing so much about food and wine and music in those last months. It's a hymn to life. Yeah. Um, Very true. 
Uh, Joe Mullen, well done, Nico. Nice to see a wall of musical instruments instead of books. <laughs> Beautifully read. Hey, Joe. <laughs> and there is a lot of music in, in Matthew's work as well, quite, quite clearly we've heard tonight and, and from all the other books too. You adore jazz. Um, he was always buying jazz CDs. And in fact, um, he loved Scandinavian jazz. You know, and he was very au fait with the young jazz musicians of, of um, Europe and uh, Scandinavia. He was, he was seemed to be totally up to date with what was happening. He was always following it. And whenever we travel, he'd buy jazz. And, you know, it was really his favorite type of music. Um, and he did have it. He played it every every day. Jazz and cooking, you know, they were sort of they went hand in hand with the poetry, you know. Um, somebody was uh, talking about his small handwriting, the, um, Tom, but, but the, that kind of minuteness is there in, uh, in the poetry and in the way he cooked as well. He was very uh, refined and he used to cut everything up really small. I mean, I was horrified when he moved into my house and started slicing bread. And I realized that I was just this uncouth clod hopper when it came to <laughs> slicing bread <laughs> because he could slice bread like a like lace you know and uh, it was all very fine and very minute and in fact when um, we got together first I actually framed one of his shopping lists because it was so tiny the writing yes it really was minute that was very much part of Matthew's uh, it was it was his thing is his writing was very small it's very fine when he'd chop uh, an onion or garlic or bread it was very fine or you know if you saw him chopping parsley for example um, and I guess that went into the poetry as well you know it's all part of the same the same thing really you know I've got a message for you Mary from uh, Dean Brown who wanted wants to know if Matthew listened to jazz while while writing and did he have a go-to album? Well, you know, not really. I mean, he he didn't like listening to anything with words in it while he was writing. I mean, but he he may well have had, he would have had, yeah, jazz on. And he, you know, he loved um, the Wasserfuhr brothers or um, EST or, uh, and he adored John Coltrane, which comes up in, in the poems as well, you know. Um, so uh, Coltrane was was one of his heroes, um, but again, and there were a lot of uh, the younger German and Baltic East uh, Scandinavian jazz musicians that he uh, that he loved as well. And also, how did he go about writing the owl as you remember it? Well, you know, he wrote that poem in the month in the weeks leading up to the final diagnosis, and uh, he was going crazy, of course, as I'm sure you can understand, as anyone who's been in that situation will know that waiting for a diagnosis is a terrible thing. And of course, we were waiting for the worst kind of diagnosis. And uh, so he started writing this poem, but he didn't know that it was going to be 12 stanzas long. He imagined this owl coming to the backyard. Um, and then he wrote a stanza one night and then he went back to the table the next night and he wrote another one. And after a few days, he said to me, it's amazing, this poem, it just keeps coming. And I said, and when will it be finished? And he said, I don't know, you know, I'll just keep writing it. And he wrote um, 12 stanzas, you know, and in the end, um, it just came to a natural conclusion. The owl flew away. This owl, which was seeming to want to deliver a message, but the owl, then in the end, the owl never delivered the message and just flew off, you know? Um, and in fact, it turned out that the poem was a bit of a premonition uh, to what actually happened to Matthew in that the, when he got his diagnosis, um, the neurologist um, gave him his diagnosis over the phone, which I, you know, I believe was a very, very cruel thing to do um, in that Matthew was in town shopping and he was he was in a betting office actually when the mobile phone rang and he got his somebody on the end of it was saying you have motor neuron disease you know uh, I, I found that very shocking um, but that's the way it happened the cowardly owl 
you know, didn't deliver his message face to face anyway, you know. So, I mean, I suppose a lot of people who write poems would know that poetry can sometimes be premonitory, you know, and, uh, and that was certainly an example of that. Um, it, it, he got it just right in the poem. It was mm. exactly what happened, you know. And he the other thing is his previous books have always been full of crows, haven't they? But it's as though yeah. the owls have taken over from the crows in this book. Yeah. Well, the owl, of course, being a portent of, of death, you know, mm. uh, there, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. But Matthew was a creature person, a creature lover. He loved animals. He, he yeah. always wrote about them. Um, they're all over his books, you know, but the owl came to the fore at the very end. But also the owl was the owl of Minerva, uh, wisdom as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, uh, we've had all the questions and uh, messages come through now. Um, if anyone from amongst us wants to say anything, then we can do. Otherwise, we should thank our audience for staying with us for so long. Um, anyone want to add anything? I mean, I'd just like to thank everybody who came along tonight. Uh, as Nico said, Matthew's family, his, um, his sister Downit, his brother Padge, his son Malvin in London, who's a, a policeman, and uh, Nico herself, and all the extended family, and all of Matthew's many, many friends. Uh, I'd also like to thank our lovely readers, all very, very close to Matthew, his friends. Thank you so much for reading tonight. Well, thank, thank you, Mary, and thank you for to our readers. Thank you also to Pete and Jane for helping on the technical side, and thank you, our lovely audience out there. Um, just a reminder, Shadow of the Owl is published on Thursday, but if you want to get hold of it quickly, you can order it from the Blood Axe website. And if you scroll down on the YouTube page you're looking at, you click on Show More, you'll find a direct link there where you can just click on and buy the book. So thank you very much. Thank you for everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.